15 or 20 years time, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. In 1865, when the enslavement of African Americans came to an end, many believed that a new era of liberty and justice was dawning. Yet by the start of the 20th century, these hopes looked forlorn. Black people were denied the vote and remained impoverished. <laughs> Black people were victims of violence and murder. Across America, resistance to racism was met with deadly force. At the same time, as Europe's nations built empires across the globe, Africans and Asians were being stripped of their land and brutalized. In the West, Popular culture reinforced the idea of a racial hierarchy and white supremacy by ridiculing black people. Throughout the 20th century, from the Mississippi cotton fields and South African diamond mines, a tale of exploitation and racial violence unfolds. Many people would lose their lives resisting, fighting battles that continue in many countries today. campaign to abolish slavery in the United States had drawn support from all over the world. Abolition was acclaimed as a triumph for all humanity, but soon black Americans would realize that racism had outlived slavery. Near the end of the Civil War, the Northern Union Army had promised 40 acres to each freed slave who would fight the Southern Confederate Army. But the following year, the order was rescinded and the lands were returned to the white plantation owners of the South, leaving many with no choice but to work for their former masters. They became farm laborers as part of a system known as sharecropping. The way it worked is, is that a black family would work for a white landlord for a period of a year. And during that time, the family would receive canned goods, food, uh, a plow, mules, animals, seeds, other implements that were necessary to produce a cash crop, let's say cotton. And the split was half, 50-50, minus the costs that had been incurred during the previous growing season by the black family. And what usually occurred since the black household did not keep the books, blacks owed more money at the end of the year to white families, and so the debt was rolled over. Blacks essentially never got out of debt. After the Civil War, the 13th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution outlawed slavery and extended the vote to adult black men. But in the South, these hard-won rights were thwarted. What they did was to find ways to stop black people from voting, they created um, so uh, literacy tests, basically, they said, or, or other exams that you had to pass in order to be allowed to vote. And um, a, a white person would show up and they would be asked, you know, um, what country is this? And they would say, United States, go ahead, vote. And then a black person would show up and they'd first of all see if they could read. And if they could read, they would then ask them a question like, what is the third phrase in the First Amendment governing religion, uh, which, of course, most white people couldn't have answered either. By the end of the 19th century, the southern states made it legal to offer so-called separate but equal services to their black citizens. 
These laws denied black Americans equal access to public amenities, such as education and transport, turning the United States into a racially segregated nation. Soon, millions living in the land of the free found themselves trapped by the Jim Crow system, named after a vaudeville act that ridiculed black people. The key thing to grasp about the so-called Jim Crow laws is that they were really about enforcing the idea of racial inequality in everyday life. And so there were laws that explicitly governed things like where black people could sit in buses, whether they could stay in hotels, which hotels they could stay in, whether they could eat in the same places and so on. But also around them was a set of practices of everyday life which were not legally enforceable, um, but which reflected the very same ideas. So, for example, uh, black people weren't supposed to look white people in the face in the street. I mean, uh, if there was not enough space on the pavement, the black person was supposed to get off. Or, in the end, if, if, the, if you looked in the wrong place, if you uh, did what was once called reckless eyeballing, if a black man looked at a white woman in the wrong way, he could end up being lynched. Jim Crow, legal racial segregation, was a regime of white over black, and that the heart of Jim Crow was violence. And violence took several different forms, but the chief form it took was lynching. Between 1882 to about 1927, 3,500 African Americans were lynched in the United States. Jim Crow was a system of political and economic terror. Slavery was always a kind of perverse blessing for blacks in the sense that they were defined as property. In the early 1850s, a 21-year-old black man, a field hand, was worth $1,000. And so whites had a vested interest, perhaps to beat their slaves, but not to kill them. The fear that white people had of black people was so deeply internalized and reinforced by church and government and business that black town halls were burned, black churches were burned. And if a black man defended himself against the aggressor, against a white man, not only could he be killed, but his family could be killed. He might be subjected to hours of torture. In some cases, more than one, a black man was tied on a log and burned from his feet up so that an extensive crowd of people could take pleasure out of the screams and the horror. At his home near Savannah, Georgia, James Allen has collected a photographic record of racial violence in the South. For the past 20 years, he's found horrifying pictures in the family albums of ordinary southern homes. Many are postcards that were mass-produced as souvenirs. Some of these images were printed in the tens of thousands and sold for a dime or a dollar apiece. Some of the postcards tell you where to write and the discounts you'll get if you buy one, ten, or a hundred. They were sold in drugstores and pharmacies. They were sold on the street. I purchased a photograph from a woman. The photographer sold them door to door. Her mother bought the image for two bucks. 
A murder that is of particular interest to me was of a 17-year-old boy by the name of Jess Washington in Waco, Texas, in 1916. He was seriously mentally challenged. The wife of the farmer that he worked for was found dead. He was arrested. He was brought to trial. The trial took from 10 until 12. And when the jury came back at noon and found him guilty, someone in the courtroom, and it could have been, would have been anyone in the courtroom, screamed out, get that nigger. In one of the worst and cruelest treatments of a human being began. Just was kicked down out of the courthouse, down the back steps where a crowd of several hundred was waiting for. They put a chain on his neck. There were 16,000 people crowding the street to watch this boy be tortured. Jess was tied to the chain over a branch of a tree. The fire was started. They raised Jess from the fire up into the air so that the crowd could see him. There were cheers, like at a football game, cheering the torturers on. When Jess tried to climb up the chain, hand by hand, they cut his fingers off one by one so that all he could do was slap at the chain. They lowered him back down in the fire. A man came up and castrated him. Another man kept a pole so that he couldn't crawl out of the fire. And time and again, they pulled him up to keep him from dying so that the crowd could be satisfied until he finally died. Many of these murders were instigated by America's most powerful agent of racial terror. At its peak, the Ku Klux Klan had up to five million members. An average of two lynchings every week resulted. The Klan was just one source of racial violence. Scores of black Americans were killed during the Red Summer Riots of 1919. More bloodshed followed two years later in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Over 300 people were killed and thousands were left homeless after envious white people attacked the city's most prosperous black community. Much of this history of racial violence has been erased from public memory. Several state archives have cut out photographs and newspaper reports of lynchings. And James Allen's attempts to show his collection in Atlanta's leading academic institutions have been repeatedly blocked. White America has maintained to this day control of the history of racial violence as victors. It's as if we live in an occupied country intellectually. And as long as white America maintains the power and maintains the myth of moral superiority, the history will never become public, fully public, and be written into our national conscience. Violence was just one way of maintaining the racial hierarchy. Newspapers, film and theater stereotyped black people as simple-minded figures of fun. Some black performers applied minstrel makeup to caricature themselves as shuffling Negroes, reinforcing the sense of superiority amongst white audiences. What it really essentially said about black people is that we were outside of the pale of civilization. So to pillory and to make blacks buffoons is to deny them human capacity. And for whites, it was a grand old time. And for the first half of the 20th century, minstrelsy and blackface was not just reputable, but it was a central feature of entertainment in America. Everywhere you looked, black people were being portrayed 
as dense, incompetent, irrational savages. In vaudeville and on stage, African American people were reduced to silly, childlike characters who needed to be trained like a monkey. Thank God those savages were saved from their natural habitat. The humiliation and violence inflicted on black Americans was mirrored in Africa. At the end of the 19th century, as Europe's powers scrambled for control of the continent's riches, the rights of the indigenous peoples were no impediment to their plans for conquest. The attitude of white people in all Europe was uh, tabula rasa, terra incognita, here is a place which is a sort of no man's land. And in other words, we can create our own states there and we're going to bring order and civilize them. Always the word civilized was used, whatever you were actually doing, whether you were shooting them, you were civilizing them. The vast majority of people thought they would need, at best, a paternalistic uh, a treatment that they would need looking after, like children. After the Conference of Berlin in 1885, Europeans embarked on a continent-wide land grab. In less than 20 years, 90% of African territory would be placed under European colonial rule. One of the main beneficiaries was King Leopold II of Belgium. Aware of the vast fortune to be made, he persuaded Europe's powers to recognize his sovereignty over one of Africa's largest regions the Congo. Here was this man who became King of Belgium in 1865 at the age of 30. Uh, enormously shrewd, enormously greedy, enormously ambitious, uh, and with an absolutely brilliant sense of public relations. He hired the explorer, Henry Morton Stanley, the man who found Livingston, to go to the Congo and essentially stake out this huge territory for him. Leopold got first the United States and then all the major nations of Western Europe to ratify his seizure of this enormous territory in the center of the continent. First, Leopold created a smokescreen, claiming that he wished to educate a savage people. They were all really fooled by Leopold because they uh, took him at his word. They thought he was a sort of a man's going to lose all his money in this crazy philanthropic venture. But they didn't realize what he was really after at all, which was to make himself hugely rich by exploiting brown hands and broad backs who were going to carry the wealth of Africa and load it on ships for his own personal profit. Bring them. Extreme violence was employed to impose Leopold's dominion. The right hands of those who failed to meet rubber quotas were severed. Even young children were not spared. In 1896, a German newspaper reported that 1,308 hands had been gathered in one day. Leopold created a 90,000 strong army to enforce his rule. One of his lieutenants wrote, only the whip can civilize the black. They would go into village after village. The army would seize the women of the village and hold them hostage in order to force the men of each village to go into the forest and gather a monthly quota of wild rubber. And they did this for about 20 years. And you can just very easily imagine if you have a village where the women are all being held hostage, the men are all in the forest as forced laborers for several weeks out of each month. There's nobody to plant and harvest food, to go hunting, to go fishing, to do all the normal things through which a community feeds itself. So from all of these causes, starvation, being worked to death, and most of all from the disease that hit this famine-ridden population, the best estimates are that between 1880, when King Leopold first got his hands on the Congo, 
and 1920, that in that 40-year period, the population was slashed from about 20 million at the beginning of that period to around 10 million at the end. So an enormous loss of human life. Huge building projects throughout Belgium were funded by Leopold's wealth to celebrate his reign. Leopold built himself a palace, now called the Museum of Central Africa, to display his spoils. For historian Bambi Koipins, whose father is Congolese, the building embodies the myths created to justify Belgian rule in the Congo. The central hall gives you the idea of what the museum is supposed to be about. You have the central dome through which the light falls on the heart of darkness underneath, you can say. Simultaneously, the dome also presents the sky, God, and then in the central hall, underneath that representation of Leopold II, are statues of Congolese. So what you really see were the hierarchical relationships that struck the relations between the colonized and the colonizers. As a human being, I'm obviously shocked by that because it is uh, very clear that uh, Africans, the way that this museum was originally set up and the way that uh, most of the exhibitions still work, are really dehumanized uh, because they were seen and represented as savages who really needed the help of outsiders, i.e. Europeans, to transform them into fully civilized human beings. From the late 19th century onwards, Human zoos exhibiting Africans in their primitive state became popular around Europe. One of the first was housed in the grounds of Leopold's museum. The Africans were put on display so people could go and see them in very much the same way that they could look at, say, caged animals in a zoo. And their reactions were also very similar. There were notices saying that people were not allowed to throw peanuts uh, at the Africans because that was what they did. This museum is also, in a very real sense, the only monument to Belgian colonial history left in this country. So if we dismantle the museum, there is a very great danger that we also eradicate the public memory of that colonial heritage. And once that happens, of course, one paves the way for all these people who say, well, it was not as bad as that, was it? And Leopold II really did do a great deal of good. In 1908, the year before Leopold died, his crimes were made public, and he was forced to hand control of the Congo over to the Belgian government. But the cruelty continued. The forced labor system did not come to an end because it was so profitable. The new Belgian Congo continued it more or less until the early 1920s. At that point, the Belgian colonial officials realized that their population was shrinking so rapidly from the effects of the forced labor system that they had to modify it. They had to make it less lethal, or otherwise they would have no labor force left. Although 10 million people died, the Congolese genocide has largely been forgotten in Europe. In the book, The Heart of Darkness, the author, Joseph Conrad, who witnessed the violence in the Congo, writes, the conquest of the earth, which mostly means taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. It was only at the end of the Second World War, when newsreels documented the Nazis' extermination of six million Jews, that the words genocide, holocaust, and even racism passed into common usage. Whatever the origins of the word racism, that is when it was first coined, there's no doubt that it was first used to think about Nazi treatment of uh, Jewish people. That was the case that gave the word racism its modern shape and meaning, in fact, brought it into use as a word, and also, therefore, brought it into use in a context where it was unequivocally clear that it was a very bad thing. Even so, 
brutal treatment of non-white, non-Europeans was tolerated by the Western nations. When the National Party came to power in South Africa in 1948, they passed a series of laws that institutionalized white supremacy. Yet apartheid attracted little criticism from the West. What white people wanted in this country was to protect their political supremacy, but in ways that nevertheless guaranteed them access to as much black labor as they wanted. One should remember that apartheid was never a racially exterminationist regime. The intention was never to get rid of black people. The intention was to deploy black people in ways that made good economic sense to white people so that the advantages of apartheid to whites would be a combination of political supremacy and economic prosperity. So the purpose of racial classification was to provide a mechanism for segregating access to resources, segregating access to power. So your racial classification, once determined, affected where you lived, it determined where you worked and what sort of work you were entitled to do, it determined who you had sex with and who you could marry, it determined what schools your children went to and what universities they were entitled to go to, it determined what shops you, you were allowed to use, whether you were allowed to drink certain kinds of alcohol and where, whether you were entitled to go to cinemas. In other words, it was a categorization that affected your life across the board um, and it became internalized as in, in a very intimate way as the basis of how people thought of themselves. Do you think that the South African government's racial policy is right? I really do because we cannot mix with the lower nations at the moment unless they are cultivated and educated and so on. Apartheid erected a vast edifice of racist legislation, making interracial relationships illegal and forcing individuals to be racially categorized. Amid rising international criticism of their policies, the architects of apartheid emulated the creators of Jim Crow and adopted the separate but equal rhetoric of segregation. The South African government just changed its rhetoric and it began saying uh, not that blacks were inferior creatures but rather that uh, everybody could govern themselves in their own particular places and ways so it set up these ten so-called homelands the, or bantu stands as they were once called where close to a majority of the population of south africa was crammed onto these desolate stretches of land that never amounted to more than a tiny percentage of the country's land area and they were dressed up with prime ministers and cabinets and uh, flags and so forth but it was a sham but they had to go through the sham because things in the world had changed and if they would had been doing this in the early 19th century they wouldn't have bothered about any of the sham during the 1950s the anti-apartheid movement gained momentum in 1960 300 people demonstrated against the pass laws in a town called Sharpville in the Transvaal using the tactics of non-violent passive resistance developed over the years. In South Africa, you'd had a history of very peaceful, uh, humble, uh, polite petitioning of the authorities, deputations, and uh, each deputation, uh, you know, uh, came back empty-handed. And well, if that doesn't work, let's try something else. So people then adopted non-violent forms of resistance. Uh, but that was just met with violence, culminating in Sharpul. That was, in a sense, a turning point for everyone, that you know, people assemble outside a police station in a demonstration unarmed, and 69 of them, majority shot in the back, meaning that they were actually fleeing from the scene. Of course, that creates a great deal of anger. And uh, I think for many people, that was it. And people said, well, 
if that's going to be the response, uh, we've got to have to find other means of, uh, of taking care of this situation. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks. Following the Sharpeville massacre, the African National Congress was banned, and two years later, its leader, Nelson Mandela, was imprisoned. At his trial, he announced that the events of 1960 had compelled the ANC to commit itself to armed struggle. Violence, said Mandela, was inevitable in this country. The architects of apartheid turned his prophecy into a reality. Increasingly, they began to kill people. I think it was just deliberate murder of people. It was not a mistake. There was hardly a family in the urban areas and townships and later in the rural areas that had not been affected by detentions, by torture. So it was just about every family in the townships was affected by it. In 1976, South Africa's black school children protested against a new law stipulating that classes be taught in Afrikaans, a language most couldn't speak. A quarter of a million black people rioted in Soweto alone. Over 500 people were killed by the police during the Soweto uprising, including black consciousness leader Steve Biko. South Africa was engulfed in a firestorm of violence. Yet in the West, there were still many apologists for apartheid. But this isn't surprising. In the southern states of the USA, many features of apartheid, the disenfranchisement of black voters, laws against intermarriage and segregation, endured well after the Second World War. As in South Africa, racial violence remained commonplace. In 1946, African-American soldiers returning from the war were being lynched at a rate of one a week. There are cases when black soldiers waiting at the train station, uh, uh, waiting uh, their ride, were, were lynched because how dare they wear that uniform? They had died for the lyncher and his right to murder them. This was the paradox and indeed the vicious irony of uh, the black participation in the Second World War and the fight for democracy on foreign shores, which drove them to fight even more vigorously back here at home. Protests from prominent anti-racists, including Paul Robeson and Albert Einstein, prompted President Truman, himself a former member of the Ku Klux Klan, to appoint a committee that campaigned to end lynching. At last, government initiatives to counter racism began to trickle through. In 1955, the ruling in the Brown versus the Board of Education case found that the provision of separate but equal schools was unconstitutional, bringing segregation in the education system to an end. White supremacists mounted resistance to the move. At Little Rock, Arkansas, National Guardsmen protected black pupils who had to run a gauntlet of racist violence in order to attend school. By the mid-1950s, those who resisted racism were liable to suffer severe reprisals, as was shown by the experience of a 14-year-old from Mississippi, Emmett Till. I'm Simeon Wright, the, the son of Mose Wright. I lived in Mississippi in 1955. Emmett Till and my cousin Wheeler came to visit us. Wednesday, this is the fateful night that we went into Money, Mississippi went to this little town, little store, uh, Bryant's Grocery. After we got outside, Mrs. Bryant came out behind us, and she was walking towards her car, and that's when Emmett whistled at her. And when he whistled, man, it scared us out of our wits because we knew that was a taboo, and we couldn't get to the car fast enough to get out of there. And we got in the car, we came home. Uh, Emmett and I, we went to bed, and about, I would say 2 a.m. in the morning, I heard this noise in the house, and I woke up, I saw two white men standing at the foot of the bed. And they marched Emmett out to the truck, so they took Emmett, and three days later, we found out they had killed him, 
He was thrown in the Tallahassee River. My dad said it looked like they had hit him in the head with a hammer. He was shot behind the ear. It, it was just a horrible scene. I believe that the whole United States is mourning with me. And if the death of my son can mean something to the other unfortunate people all over the world, then for him to have died a hero would mean more to me than for him just to have died. I am its mother. She decided that she wanted the world to see what those men had done to her son. So what she, they had a cassette, the top was glass, and you could see the body. You could see his mutilated body during the funeral procession. And the whole world were able to see what the Jim Crow laws and the people of Mississippi, the white people of Mississippi were doing to blacks. I never will forget it. I was five years old when I saw that picture. I was just stunned by the ferocity of hate that had produced the violence on this young man's body. And for Negro Americans, it strengthened our resolve that Jim Crow had to go. Emmett Till's death was a catalyst. Less than four months after the murder, on December the 5th, 1951, Rosa Parks was arrested when she refused to give up her seat on a bus to a white passenger in Montgomery, Alabama. When Martin Luther King called for the Montgomery bus boycott, 99% of the black population took part, action which led to a Supreme Court ruling in 1956, which desegregated the buses the civil rights movement was born. Civil rights protests met with violence, as happened when black people tried to eat at segregated lunch counters. Throughout the 1960s, protesters were wounded, imprisoned and killed. The movement's most articulate spokesmen were eventually silenced. Dr. King and Malcolm X were to be murdered. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. Freedom comes to us either by ballots or by bullets. That's the only way freedom is gotten. Although the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1968 prohibited discrimination, the majority of black people continued to live in substandard housing, go to poor schools, and experience a lifetime of poverty. Well, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. saw the failure. He said it himself. He said, look, the first part of the movement, relatively speaking, was a piece of cake. Because it was easy for America. Civil rights bill, doesn't cost much. Give people the right to vote, doesn't cost much. But now what we're doing, the second part of the movement, the, the part about economic equality and social injustice, oh, that's going to cost something. It's not about just letting us have access to the lunch counter. Martin Luther King Jr. said, what good is it to be able to go to a lunch counter but can't afford to buy the hamburger? <laughs> From 1964 to 67, there was fierce rioting in cities across the U.S. as African Americans found that the civil rights movement left them as poor as ever. And in post-war Britain, the issue of racism had also been moved onto the political agenda after race rioting at Notting Hill in 1958. Something new and ugly raises its head in Britain, racial violence. An angry crowd of youths chases a Negro into a greengrocer's shop, while police reinforcements are called to check the riot. You can get them all out of the country, and as soon as you can get them out, the better I'll be pleased, I'll tell you that. 
by the mid-60s, immigrants from the Commonwealth and the colonies were arriving at a rate of 75,000 per year. This source of cut-priced labour wasn't always welcome. A Britain that had to face that while they had never thought twice about their right to be in a third of a globe, that when people from that third of a globe started turning up in Britain itself, in the heart of empire, that somehow they didn't belong. Many black Britons welcomed the 1968 Race Relations Act, outlawing discrimination in employment and housing. But the Conservative shadow cabinet minister, Enoch Powell, attacked it in his infamous Rivers of Blood speech, making dire predictions about the consequences of immigration. He received over 40,000 letters of support. The discrimination and the deprivation, the sense of alarm and of resentment lie not with the immigrant population, but with those among whom they have come and are still coming. Once that speech had been given, it produced a fundamental shift, I think, in the thinking of black people around their feelings of belonging to the United Kingdom, uh, their feelings of being loyal colonial subjects and, and then being abused in this way. The newly formed National Front took up Powell's banner. Its membership rose to more than 20,000 by 1974. The rise of the National Front in the 70s, uh, that was uh, a terrifying time if you were young. You had to be, if you were young and black, you had to be very fit, able to fight and run very fast indeed. I remember in, uh, in our areas, in Oldham and places where I grew up, you literally had to jog through enemy territory. It was almost like uh, some Hollywood movie, a gang movie. You were on your toes all the time because if the skinheads came around the corner, you needed that half a yard advance on them to get away. Madness. Madness. By the time of the 1976 Notting Hill Carnival, many black people had lost faith in the police force. Madness. The communities were already on a war footing with the police by 76 because the generation that I was from was saying to our parents, well, you may have put up with it, but we were born here and we are certainly not going to put up with it. We are broadly politicised by the civil rights movements in America and the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. And so we are keenly aware of what our rights are and we will not suffer to be oppressed. The policing of 76 was swamp policing. So we're already in this age where the mass deployment of officers to reclaim the streets. There was a battle to claim the streets. It was the police saying, this is our territory, we're the biggest gang, we run it, you are going to do exactly as we tell you to do. And there was black people saying, you're racist, you're attacking our young people, our young people have the right to defend themselves, we will not put up with your behaviour anymore. All that came together into a heady mix of marijuana music and madness in the Nottingham Carnival in 76. Very aggressive policing had been going on for very many years. You know, a group of young black men immediately being seen as threatening by the police as opposed to a group of young white men. People said no more. For the next five years, relations between black Britons and the police smouldered with resentment until on the 10th of April, 1981, the arrest of a young man under the so-called Sus Laws in Brixton, South London, sparked off a series of riots throughout Britain. The fact that it was a shock to many people in British society just reinforces how many people just did not want to know <laughs> what was happening around them and that they turned a blind eye to intolerance to injustice and to police brutality. In 1981, 30 riots occurred across Britain. From London, Liverpool and Leeds, 
Dr. Handworth, Halifax and High Wycombe. The official report into the riots by one of Britain's most senior judges, Lord Scarman, identified poor social conditions as the problem, rejecting the idea of institutionalised racism within the police. But in 1993, when the 18-year-old student Stephen Lawrence was murdered during an unprovoked attack by a white gang in South London, the subsequent investigation came to a very different conclusion. Nobody came and spoke to us. No police officer ever came and said, well, this is what's happened to your son or anything. The police, on the night, they did nothing. So they gave Stephen no first aid. They never checked anything. They didn't put him in a recovery position. He fell like that and they just left him there and until the ambulance arrived. So even if they could have done anything to help him, they did nothing. From the moment that Steen was killed, people came to our house giving names and addresses of who they believed to be the killer of Stephen. Those information was passed straight away to the police. We kept nothing back. Um, days that followed, they spent the time investigating us as a family, as far as they're concerned that Stephen was black, so automatically he had to be in a gang, he had to have a criminal record, he had to have something. And that is not true, because you, you, you may have, I don't know how many percentage of families would be like that, but the, the large majority of black families are not like that, they're just like myself. So rather than investigate his murder, they investigated him. For me, the central thing of the uh, Stephen Lawrence tragedy um, was the failure of the legal system. And that, that history of failure is something that goes back before Stephen Lawrence was killed. It goes back to a period when black people became victims of crime and went to the police to, to, to speak of that victimage and to demand their help and protection in managing the risks and uh, dangers involved. They were treated themselves as criminals. While the police spent two weeks investigating the Lawrence family, his alleged killers disposed of vital evidence. Following the 1999 inquiry into the murder by Sir William McPherson, institutional racism was identified as one of the reasons that Stephen's killers evaded justice. The McPherson report was an incredibly important uh, document, uh, and still remains so, in terms of getting white society in Britain to understand the fundamental dynamics of a phenomena called institutionalized racism. And that is where you have no overt policy saying anyone is discriminated against, but that all the outcomes of your operations are overtly discriminatory. How do you get there? How does that happen? It's the culture of racism within an organization that overpowers the formal uh, commitment to equality that produces the racist outcomes. And we needed that phenomenon nailed, as that is exactly what happened during the case of Stephen Lawrence and very, many other black people throughout the country. It's widely believed that Britain has become a less racist country, yet black Britons are overrepresented in the economic underclass. In some senses today I think we may be going backwards and the reason why I say that is because the scale of racial inequality over uh, the last 20 years from 1986 to 2006 has increased. What's up? What's up? Infant mortality rate for black people has increased. Educational failure rate for black people has increased generally across the country. Unemployment uh, rates for black people have hardly shifted in 30 years, still incredibly high. Uh, uh, imprisonment rates uh, uh, are still uh, uh, very high. 33% of all prisoners are from the Afro-Caribbean uh, community uh, and population uh, that are jailed in London. So we're still seeing a huge discriminatory impact of race impacting upon black people's lives. Though the former colonies are now independent, the global racial order remains intact. The distribution of wealth and power across the world hasn't changed since the days when ideas of racial hierarchy legitimized colonial conquests. White people in the Northern Hemisphere remain relatively rich and long-living, while the non-white peoples of Asia and Africa endure poverty and disease. Even in South Africa, the defeat of apartheid in 1994 hasn't resulted in the redistribution of wealth that was hoped. 
Today, the wealth gap between the average black person and the white rich is greater in real terms than it was in 1990 when the white supremacists ruled. It's one of the deals that had to be cut. If you want to strip it of a lot of the verbiage, uh, what it came down to was that, uh, well, the whites would accept uh, democracy provided that they wouldn't stripped of the property they'd acquired as a result of racial oppression. That's basically what the deal was. If when the African National Congress took over, they had said, uh, okay, we want just not a political revolution, but an economic one. We're gonna radically redistribute the wealth of this country as we've been promising all these years, you know, to give the mines to those who work in them and the factories to those who work in them and so forth. I think they would not have been allowed to be part of the international economic system. And I think that uh, probably the majority of the white population would have left the country if their wealth had been taken away from them, their land had been taken away from them, as happened in Zimbabwe, for example. And economically, that would have been disastrous. In the United States, the overt structures of racism have been dismantled without many black Americans escaping poverty. A recent study found that in 1968, a typical black family had around 60% of the income of an average white family. Today, it has only 58%. Black unemployment is more than twice that of whites, a gap wider than in 1972. Black infants are almost two and a half times more likely to die in their first year of life, worse than in 1970. The belief that we live in a post-racist society has blinded us to the impact that skin color plays in determining our destinies. Identically qualified black and white resumes, where the black ones are identified by the fact that the, the candidate has a name that is recognizably associated with African American identity, get different treatment when they're when they arrive on the desks of employers. And this is not a hypothesis, this is an experiment that has been done uh, in some cases with large numbers of, uh, large amounts of data. And, and that's just still true. It's still true that being black disadvantages you in the employment market, just as, uh, by the way, uh, being a woman does, uh, doing the same experiments. Uh, and that's despite the fact, probably, that the, uh, the officials who manage this system don't think, of, uh, don't think of themselves as racist and don't recognize what they're doing as practicing some kind of racial discrimination. What drives the colorblind racism of the 21st century are three central institutional processes. Mass unemployment, mass incarceration, and mass disenfranchisement. Mass unemployment, that is, for young black and Hispanic males between the ages of about 18 years to 35 years. In 1980, there were about a half million prisoners in the United States. Today, there are 2.3 million. About half of them are black in the United States. And so this process of mass incarceration in many states leads to the third pillar of colorblind racism, which is mass disenfranchisement. So in the state of Florida in the year 2000, where George Bush wins the presidency by fewer than 600 votes, in that state, 818,000 Florida citizens who live in that state, they pay taxes to the United States, could not vote for the rest of their lives. Disenfranchisement is not the only feature of Jim Crow to have resurfaced. In the mid-1990s, the bell curve became a bestseller by claiming that black people's poor performance in IQ tests proved their innate intellectual inferiority to white people. This was used to justify cutting back black people's benefits. But later criticisms were given little media attention. Its research relied on funding from the Pioneer Fund, a trust endowed by a Nazi sympathizer. Its authors acknowledged help from a professor who writes, what is called for here is not genocide of incompetent cultures, 
but the phasing out of such peoples. It was suggesting you can throw all the money you want and you can try to give them all the education you want, it will be a waste. A pig is a pig is a pig is a pig, and you can't put a pig in a chicken coop, because pigs are pigs, and chickens are chickens, and eagles are eagles. And so what it was trying to suggest is that all the social programming that, and social engineering that you're putting forth to help black people is all for naught, because they're inherently inferior. Today, science is eroding the biological basis for the idea of race. The Human Genome Project has found that the average genetic difference between one African and another is the same or greater than that between a black person and a white person. The only genes that distinguish races are those determining skin color. And yet for many people, those genes, just five out of around 25,000, continue to shape destinies and determine fates. The mythology of race exists for no other reason than to justify the attempt of one group to dominate another. And the useful fiction of race continues to allow people to conspire against the best in our human communities. So uh, you can say to a guy, for instance, who's trying to hail a cab in New York City, excuse me, cab, I know you think I'm a black man and that race exists. I'm a fiction. I'm a figment of your imagination. I'm a social construct. There's no biological base or empirical verification for my melanin differential. I'm simply another human being possessing a different magnitude of melanin. I still ain't picking you up because you're trying to go to Harlem, brother. That's race. Despite the long struggle against racism, it continues to pollute our mental environment. Its enduring potency ensures that people are denied opportunities, justice, and human rights. Key institutions stay racially monolithic, and racial privilege endures. For five centuries, racism has legitimized assassination, massacres, and genocides. The doctrine of white supremacy has demonized, brutalized, and dehumanized the non-white peoples of the earth. Racism has been the global driving force behind the dispossession of continents, the destruction of civilizations, and the extermination of entire peoples. The legacy of enslavement and empire has created deadly divides between the West and the rest. In scientific terms, Racial differences have no material significance. Yet racism continues to shape the destinies of individuals and nations all over our world. <laughs>